and welcome to your region this week. I'm Anandi Kara Woolery. It's been a busy week, so let's get started. On Wednesday, Brantford held their annual Hockey Night in Brantford Encore Game at the Wayne Gretzky Sports Center. We spoke with Phil McCollman about the game and took in a bit of the action. This is Hockey Night in Brantford, the 2019 version, which is the seventh year we've been uh, staging this charity game. This is uh, to raise money for good causes in the community. This year the proceeds are going to a very worthy charity called Crossing All Bridges Learning Center. Uh, prior years we've raised money for the United Way, uh, the Arnold Anderson Sports Fund here in Brantford, but it's just a way that we can give something back to the community. Um, this year's is Crossing All Bridges Learning Center. Other years it's a, multi uh, a number of charities through the United Way umbrella and uh, the other single charity that we have supported is the Arnold Anderson Sports Fund. I should say we've also supported Big Brothers and Big Sisters in different uh, iterations in the years past. Well, you know what this is? This is a celebration of everything hockey. And of course, if people are, are aware and most are of the storied hockey history of Brantford, and uh, of course the greatest player in the world coming out of Brantford in many people's opinion, uh, Wayne Gretzky and the Gretzky story, but it's more than that. It's, it's about the fact that this, this uh, community has produced many elite athletes in various sports and uh, hockey is one, one of the primary ones and so this is a celebration of, of community heritage and pulling everyone together at a time of the year when they're normally not interested in hockey. We, have, uh, we, would, rec we would ask you to direct donations to our charity that we're giving uh, a very large check to tonight and that is Crossing All Bridges Learning Center. They, are, they serve uh, intellectually disabled adults in trying to help them maximize uh, their goals in life and to become the best that they can be and there's over 75 individuals that are being served and families and so uh, you can easily look up Crossing All Bridges website and make a donation there at any time. Well you know what, what, what makes me I suppose uh, the most excited and, and frankly the most proud is the fact that the players who are being on the ice tonight are all in their way accomplished most of them are, some of them have made it to the NHL. There's, as we just saw here, four NHLers that are dressing up current players in the NHL. We've got alumnus uh, who played professional hockey. But, more, but probably the most exciting thing is the young and up-and-comers. The, the 16, 17, 18-year-olds who've been drafted or, or have the dream of their hockey career. They're from our community. They've played through the minor hockey system here. And it's really, really a, a tribute to to the whole community that we are so strong when it comes to comes to athletics and hockey in particular. Last week, educators from across Canada arrived back home after a two-week long trip in Europe, visiting the beaches and monuments where Canadian soldiers fought for their lives and our country. We met with an educator from Guelph and the organizer of the trip on their journey. So this trip was originally organized back in 2005 by the founder of the Juno Beach Centre, Garth Webb. He was a Second World War veteran and it was incredibly important to him that new generations of Canadians remember the sacrifice. And he decided that the conduit to those students and those youth were the teachers of Canada. So for 14 years we've run a trip where we take about 25 to 30 teachers from across the country to major memorial sites in France and Belgium. Well, I've been teaching at Centennial in Guelph now for about 21 years. And I was approached by a gentleman named Neil Orford who's worked with the organization before and he recommended that I apply because he thought it, I would really benefit from going out and seeing these sites that I've often taught about but never actually visited. On the personal side, I got to stand on the beach where my uncle landed on D-Day, and that was on my birthday, so you can't get much better than that as far as personal experiences go. And as far as the rest went, I think it was most striking the differences in the graveyards. And I know that's hard to explain, but the British graveyards were a place of solemn reflection. And the German graveyards were brooding and dark and had a very different feeling. And the American graveyards yet again had a different, you know, each of the nations seemed to be reflecting something in their different in their war experience. And 
you can't sense that until you see that. And so to just explain how they laid out the graveyards is quite different. This year we had 20 fantastic educators um, from almost all the provinces. We were only missing Saskatchewan and Newfoundland and the territories this year, which was great representation. We fly into Brussels and go to Yeep and we visit Essex Farm where John McRae wrote uh, in Flanders Fields and we visit the St. Julian Memorial which marks the Canadian participation in the in the second battle of Ypres and then we head down into France and we go to Vimy Ridge obviously and, and Beaumont Hamel where the Newfoundlanders had a, had a, a, a massacre day on July 1st 1916 uh, and then we head to Dieppe where the Canadians landed August 19th, 1942 and um, had a huge, huge casualty rate. And that's our end opening into the Second World War. From there we head to Normandy where we spend almost a full week and we visit Pegasus Bridge, Bridge where Canadian and British paratroopers landed the night before D-Day. We spend a lot of time on the 8 kilometer stretch of Juneau Beach at the Juneau Beach Centre. And we visit other major Canadian sites and we finish off um, with some of the American sector sites like Pointe de Hoc and the American Cemetery and a, a day in Paris for shopping and tourism to, to cool everyone off at the end. Uh, they can reach out to us at the Juno Beach Centre. Uh, the easiest email is tour at junobeach.org to get in touch with me. Your Region This Week continues right after this. Welcome back. 570 News' Mike Farwell talks about how a safe consumption site works with the Director of Primary Health at the Guelph Community Health Centre, Melissa Kwiatkowski. So what does it look like when people attend? Yeah, and one thing I'll, I'll just highlight first, which is, I know is a bit confusing with the changing nomenclature. Uh, we were operating as an overdose prevention site for one year under the previous uh, Liberal government's program. Uh, since April 1st, we are operating as a consumption and treatment service as we've been fully funded um, under the Conservative government's new program. So that means you have exactly what we will be opening in a matter of weeks here in the region of Waterloo. That's right. Okay. Yeah, so um, an, an average day we have uh, different disciplines working in the site. We have registered practical nurses that monitor the consumption space. They monitor for signs and symptoms of overdose and respond when, if that happens. They also do a lot of health education and health teaching to reduce the impacts of drug use and, and help people use in safer ways. We have registered nurses that offer a full scope of nursing services, including foot care, wound care, um, some sexual health teaching and practices as well, which has been great for our community. We have a support coordinator, which is, um, I like to call them a service connector. So the support coordinators are addictions counselors and they work with clients, build relationships with them, understand our clients' strengths and needs, and they work together to come up with specialized treatment plans um, that may include connection to services like food services, housing services, oftentimes uh, addictions treatment services, many of which we have on site um, others we will refer out to um, other services in the community. How do clients find out about access or and then ultimately access your services? Does the health centre do outreach? Yeah, we have a, a huge suite of outreach services and I think the um, consumption and treatment service is part of that continuum of service. So we have specialized outreach services which are nurses and peers um, that go out into the community, meet people where they are. Uh, we have a welcoming streets initiative in our community as well, which is outreach workers that specifically liaise with uh, local businesses. And um, they respond when local businesses have concerns about um, clients in the community to be able to go up and meet and co connect clients with services. Um, we have a great relationship with our local mental health and addictions agencies, with our Guelph Police Service, who all know about and um, value the service and, and are helping um, folks get connected to the service. Are drugs provided for clients who attend the, the site? No, uh, clients come in with pre-obtained substances. What is the goal, Melissa? Is the goal to save lives 
or is the goal to move people you just mentioned whatever stage they are at in their recovery so is the goal to help them get off of drugs if that is their aim or is it both I, I think it's a little bit of both I I really see it that the benefit of our service is that when people walk in the door we welcome them just as they are there's no expectation that they're changing their behavior we welcome them just as they are so our goal is to save lives and reduce harm based on where they are right now what I find is that because we are a non-judgmental, welcoming space to all, people are able to build a relationship with the folks that work in the space. They build a relationship with the nurse. They build a relationship with the peer and the other folks that work there. And oftentimes, over time, that leads to conversations about changing behaviors, maybe um, taking the next step on their road to recovery. And because they have a trusting person that they have a relationship with, um, they're able to reach out to that person when they're ready. So we really work on a model of meeting people where they're at, true harm reduction philosophy, um, but we have all the services available if and when someone's ready to, to take the next step. So your guest mentioned that uh, these sites don't provide the drugs for the users. The users uh, obtain them on the streets wherever they get them, and they bring them to the sites, correct? Correct. Okay, and... The police, obviously, they know where these sites are, uh, so they must be looking the other way um, or else no one would, would make it with their drugs to the sites, correct? That would be a fair assumption. Yeah. So I'm kind of going to tie this into our last segment. How come it's okay for us to look the other way this time for the greater good, but not with oh the dear! SNC. Oh dear, Dylan. Do hey, come you, on! It's the same uh, you thing come on! No, it's not. It's not bending, even. It is not even. Are you joking with me right now? How is it not you, the same thing? Mike? You think kowtowing to billionaires is the same as saving the lives of somebody Everyone addicted to that drugs? Everyone called in against it. The last segment said it. you're breaking the law. You're uh, breaking the law, Dylan. These people are do, breaking the law. Okay. They're breaking the law. Okay. Hey, listen, if you, if, okay. if you want to take it your way. Then they I got change you. the laws and make make the drugs legal. Otherwise, you know what? We are looking the other way for the greater good, which is the same thing Justin Not, did with SNC. Whose life is at stake? Whose life is at stake in the SNC Lavalin affair? Please, the lives of five thousand people. At they're they're going to die without their jobs. Listen, they're going to no 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 you, no you no 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 no. Hey, they can hey. fall in depression. And oh my gosh. Drugs. Okay, sure. Are. Is their life in danger? Not directly. Then but your directly. argument sucks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm just saying. No, you're, you're just saying. If you're going to be just, hardline on 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 legal Dylan. and not legal in one case. Dylan. Be hardline everywhere. Dylan, is your life in danger if you lose your job at SNC Lavalin? Listen. Listen. No. Okay. Then drugs. you just you just. You ruined your argument again. Come with something better next time. That is That might go down as the worst argument we've ever heard made on this show. And I've made some bad arguments. This is 570 News and Rogers TV. Your region this week will be right back after this. Welcome back. 519 Sports Online covers the Waterloo Wolves alumni game featuring former players from years past. The Waterloo Wolves minor midget program holding their annual alumni game on Saturday afternoon. Former players getting a chance to catch up and reminisce about their minor midget season with the Wolves. Waterloo head coach Sean Dietrich is going into his 11th year leading the program and he is the head organizer for this event. Saturday's game featured Team Black facing Team Gold and it's Team Black who opens the scoring. Derek Jensen behind the net to Owen Parsons and the scoring star from last year's team gives Team Black a 1-0 lead. Then Chase Broda 
grabbing the loose puck. He goes backhand and scores. Broda will play for the Kempville 73s this upcoming season in Junior A hockey. Here comes Team Gold looking to strike. Lucas Gager with a sweet feed to Jackson Murray. He finishes in front. Gold is now trailing 2-1. Back comes Team Black. The pass for Tristan DeJong and he buries it. The Black squad looking good early. Later, Spencer Kirsten to Sam Cherry and he's got a wide open net. Cherry won a Cherry Cup and Sutherland Cup last season playing for the Waterloo Siskins. Owen Robertson is a big defenseman and he will play for the Siskins this season. He scores on this play giving Team Black a two goal advantage. Watch number 77 on this play. That's Spencer Kirsten scoring on the rebound and we've got a one goal game and the gold team pulls even on a beauty by Lucas Gager. He slides it home and we are knotted at Four later, it's now 5-5. Dylan Liebold, a former slow pitch star at Waterloo Oxford and Stratford Warriors captain, gives Team Gold the lead. It's 6-5. Then Spencer Kirsten making moves in front. That's his third goal of the afternoon. Kirsten giving Team Gold a 7-5 lead late in the game. Team Black pulls their goalie. Dylan Liebold with a breakaway. He leaves it for Sam. Cherry who puts the game away. Cherry with a hat trick and it's Team Gold coming out on top. 9-6 is the final. Everyone having a great time hitting the ice with former teammates and friends. Another successful year for the Wolves alumni game at Rim Park. Here is Spencer Kirsten. I just spoke getting, uh, getting together with your old minor who Waterloo uh, minor midget alum and uh, seeing the boys and seeing guys a year older, a year younger, a couple years older, a couple years younger, catching up with some friends and having a good time. So that's what it's all about. Just the, the friendships you made, you know, these are like 16 years old and, and now I'm 21 and five years you still talk to these guys and it's always great to see them again, uh, whether they're back here, like coming back for, for the summer to train or just seeing them around. It's always, always great to see them again. It's always good to give back to Dietz. He does a great job, um, runs us through a good experience and then I mean, for us to come here, I think it means a lot to him, uh, for all of us to get together. And then for me, I get to see some old teammates, uh, some old players I got to play with in the past. And I mean, it means a lot to me and you get to reminisce a little bit. I just thank every guy that has supported us over the last 10 years, right? And it's not just today, but you know, just seeing these guys today and their support with their smiles is uh, the world for me, so. On Thursday morning, the provincial government announced an expansion to the existing GO network of trains. As of August 31st, you can expect to see 50 trips on the Kitchener GO line. Also, the 6 p.m. train returning to Kitchener from Union will now run express to Bramalee before continuing on to Kitchener, saving riders 20 minutes on their trip. In total, GO Transit is adding 84 more train trips and extending 65 current trips to their network destination hubs of Niagara, Kitchener, Barry, Stouffville, and Oshawa each week. Both Mayor Vrbanovic and Mayor Jaworski are pleased with the announcement, with Jaworski tweeting a major step forward towards two-way, all-day service. And THS Industries in Kitchener was slapped with a $50,000 fine and a 25% victim fine after a worker was critically injured while installing a printing plate on a printing machine. A co-worker was operating the machine at the time and could not see the worker on the other side of the machine, resulting in the worker being pinned between two rollers of the machine. The company also received a $20,000 fine in 2017 for machines not having guards installed. Your Region This Week continues right after this.
Welcome back. The region of Waterloo held an information session on their Arts Fund program. We spoke with the chair of the committee about the fund and how people can get involved. The Arts Fund is a, a granting program that's funded mostly by the region of Waterloo and um, the budget from the region. And the reason the Arts Fund exists is that we know, we collectively know, that for successful, prosperous communities, the arts and culture and a lively cultural scene is an integral part of prosperity and a sense of community and well-being. We have two granting cycles a year, and this once in the spring and once in the fall, and all the information is on our website, which is artsfund.ca, and that's a it's not the most exciting website on earth, but it's chock-a-block with all kinds of information. Um, and so I would really encourage everyone to visit artsfund.ca. So the KW Arts Fund helped Johnny Hollow uh, put together a five-track EP. And there's five illustrations and five uh, songs based on uh, five myths from immigrants from around the area. And so we were able to bind it into a book. We did an exhibition last October to show the pieces in their full size, life size pieces, really large. And we had an opportunity to really like tell what inspired each song with each piece of folklore. And it includes Romanian, Serbian, uh, Serbian, uh, German, uh, Chinese, and uh, Arabic. So if you go to johnnyhollow.com, you can see them all. The book is available. Uh, they're also available to take a look at at my studio at 44 Gockel, right downtown Ke uh, Kitchener. So if they're going to apply, they need to go to the website, to the Arts Fund website, and uh, they can find the application there. And um, it's a two-stage application process. We're uh, soliciting applications right now for the stage one. Uh, and uh, I think the application form really helps guide the applicant through what are the um, uh, things that are important to the board as we think about uh, uh, funding their project. That's it for another episode of Your Region This Week. For more information on the show, or if you have a story idea, visit our website, rogerstv.com, and fill out the proposal form at the bottom. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.